Euzu billahi mineşşeytanirracim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi rabbil alamin. Ve la akıbetu lil muttaqin ve la udvana illa alel zalimin. Ve salatu ve selam ala eşrefil enbiya'i vel mursalin. Salavatullahi teala aleyhim ecmaîn. Subhaneke la ilme lana illa ma 'allamtena inneke entel alimul hakim. Subhaneke la fehme lana illa ma fehamtena. إنك أنت الجواد الكريم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وأفوذ أمري إلى الله إن الله غصير بالعباد اللهم صل الصلاة كاملة وسلم سلاما تاما على سيدنا محمد الذي تنحل به العقد وتنفرج به الكرب وتقضى به الحوائج وتنال به الرغائب وحس الخواتم ويستسقى الغمام بوجهه الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه في كل لمحة ونفس بعدد كل معلوم لك اللهم إنا نسألك الهدى والتقى والعفاف والغنى اللهم إنا نسألك عفو والعافية في الدين والدنيا والآخرة توفنا مسلما والحقنا بالصالحين اللهم اجعلنا من التوابين واجعلنا من المتطهرين واجعلنا من عبادك الصالحين واجعلنا من الذين لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحسنون اللهم إنا نسألك علما نافعا وقلبا خاشعا ولسانا ذاكرا وشاكرا وتوبة نصوحا رب يسر ولا تعسر رب تم بالخير رب زدني علما وفهما وَالْحِقْنَا بِالصَّالِحِينَ Ya Erhamen Rahimin, Ya Zal Celal ve Ekrem, La havle ve la kuvvete illa billahi l'aliyyil azim. Amma ba'd, Esselamu Aleyküm ve Rahmetullahi ve Berekatuhu. My very respected brothers and very respected sisters and everybody who's watching us Jazakumullah khair jazah for making an effort to come here on a Sunday afternoon where you could have spent good time with your family members to come and listen, perhaps take with you some advice from the non-qualified advice giver. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put barakah into our learning insha'Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this learning of ours part of ilman nafi'ah, beneficial knowledge. For Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us, al-ilmu ilman, there are two types of knowledge. One is, ilmun fi lisan, knowledge that is on the tongue. This particular knowledge on the tongue only shall be used against the son of Adam on the day of judgment, judgment and evidence against him on the day of judgment. This is the useless information. Lots of information but it has no benefit. Shaitan Ali Lana is on the top of this list. He knows everything. But it's useless to him. The second type of knowledge Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says Remember he said al-ilmu ilman, there are two types of knowledge. The second one, ilmun fil qalb. Knowledge that enters into the heart like a nur from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thrust into the heart of a Muslim. Then this particular knowledge transforms that person's behavior and he benefits from this knowledge. He shows in his actions. He internalizes this knowledge. This knowledge, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, "Ilman nafi'a," beneficial knowledge. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam makes dua like we did at the beginning of our talk. Allahumma inna nas'aluka ilman nafi'a. O oh Allah, please bless us with beneficial knowledge. Otherwise, the other knowledge is just dry information. We call it the Shaykh Google knowledge, which has no benefit whatsoever. It is just dry information. 
You know a lot, but it means nothing. Nothing in your behavior, nothing in your heart, but your brain is full of information. This is useless information. But the knowledge, even however little, you have internalized, entered into your heart, and changed your life, guides your life, is the beneficial knowledge. Allahumma inna nas'aluka ilman nafi'a. Oh Allah, please, we ask of you beneficial knowledge, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says. Wa qalban khashi'a. The, no, the heart that internalizes this knowledge begins to fear Allah, begins to love Allah, begins to know Allah. Qalban khashi'a. Wa lisanan dhakiran wa shakira. And the tongue which expresses that particular content of your heart by remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in everything that you do. Lisanan dhakira wa shakira. And the tongue that also expresses gratitude, shukr towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turns his dua around and he says, Allahumma inna na'udhu bika. Oh Allah, we seek refuge in you. Like we usually say, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim Oh Allah, we seek refuge in you from shaitan, the cursed one. Similarly, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Allahumma inna na'udhu, na'udhu bika min ilmin la yanfa'a. Oh Allah, we seek refuge in you from knowledge, information that has no benefit. Because that non-beneficial knowledge is going to be used against you as an evidence on the Day of Judgment. Yeah? And a heart which did not internalize, therefore does not fear you. يَرْفَعَ وَدُعَاءَ أَلَّا يُسْمَعَ وَنَفْسِ اللَّا تَشْبَعَ Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says And the amal, the deed, actions which is devoid of any sincerity did not reach you or dua that you don't hear you ignore or the nafs our egos is never satisfying never, never satisfied oh Allah please, we seek refuge in you in these The purpose of me coming here and talking to you on a topic that maybe less than 1% of the Muslims of today discuss in the world is quite fascinating. Zuhd. Either do they understand the concept of Zuhd properly or practice it. It is the most misunderstood concept. And yet, Sahabi Kiram with one Allah Ta'ala Alayhi and the subsequent generations and maybe in two, three centuries after that people used, some people used to be called Zuhad the people of Zuhd the real practicing righteous Muslims people of Taqwa people of Wara' people of Zulfa used to be called people of Zuhd Zahid we love the name Zahid we give to our daughters Zahida Boys, Zahid, without even knowing, knowing the true meaning of it. In English, when you look at this word Zahid, Zuhd means detachment of the heart from what? Dunya. How? What does it mean? There is a principle in Islam called Al Amri bil Ma'ruf wa Nahi anil Munkar, correct? which is a dynamic process, one of the most important, pivotal principles of our deen. That a Muslim, when he sees something wrong, he must stop it with his hands, if he has the power of authority. If not, he must tell off with his words, he must use his words. If not, in his heart he must feel enmity towards disapproval, towards this particular wrongdoing. Yeah? This is called al amri bil ma'roof wa nahi an al munkar. This is the munkar. And also, advising what is right, al amri bil ma'roof, is also a dynamic process. Part of our deen. Zuhd is also one of those. Muslims do not know. Muslims hear about these in storybooks. But Muslims have lost many things. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says the first thing that will disappear from my ummah after I'm gone is trust. The, the, the notion of amana. Mm -mm, trust will be gone. 
And the last thing will remain with my Ummah is Salat. Prayer. As a practice. And there are many a people who will do their Salat. Their Salat will not ever raise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. Zuhd is one of those. When you say the word Zuhd, people say what? Hmm. Especially the, under the influence of the Orientalists. They painted a picture of Zuhd in such manner that it means a person who has completely left dunya, lives like a monk, lives like a, uh, a hermit, lives like a person who is like Mother Teresa somewhere in the jungle. Somebody who has completely left dunya and neglected dunya, does not take any responsibility, lives like a person who is completely given up on dunya. No. That is not the definition of zuhd. For every definition, we go back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our master, our teacher, our sources, our references, all from Quran and Sunnah. And our ulama al-kiram, Allah ta'ala alayhim ajma'in, have taught us what zuhd is. And zuhd must be a cornerstone, a foundational stone of every Muslim, young Muslim's character, especially every da'wah worker. Every da'wah worker. If they don't have zuhd firmly established in their hearts, then there is something wrong. One way or another, not this year, not this month, but a couple of years down the track, that will cause, it will show its ugly head, nafsul ammara inside, and because you lack zuhd, you will be humiliated, you will do something really wrong within the community, you will be embarrassed and you leave your da'wah, because you do not have zuhd. Zuhd is an essential component of a Muslim's character. What does it mean? What does Zuhd mean? Let's have a look at some of the definitions. I have chosen actually three ahadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this regard. By the way, let me make a qualification. By sitting here and talking to you, by no means it is an indication that I possess Zuhd. May Allah give me Zuhd. I don't have Zuhd. I am the opposite of the Zahid. I'm the worst one of all. But for some reason, maybe the size of my beard, or the color of my beard, or the color of my taqiyya, people think that I look good as a speaker. So, they should, I should sit down and talk to people. I am giving you advice that I don't hold myself. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, also let my heart hear the things that comes out of my mouth, so I also benefit from it, inshallah. Let me whet your appetites a little bit. Ali Karam Allah narrates one particular hadith from Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What is one thing that every Muslim wants? Knowledge, remember? We talked about knowledge. Ilm al nafia in particular. Beneficial knowledge. A pursuit of knowledge is fard upon every Muslim and Muslimah. Especially somebody in da'wah work. They must have knowledge. You must seek knowledge from cradle. To the grave, yes. The greatest ibadah is seeking knowledge. If you die while you are seeking knowledge, you become shaheed, correct. Greatest dhikr is knowledge, yes. Knowledge what differentiates us from the animals, correct. Yes. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says the following. Man azdad ilman walam yazdad fi dunya zuhda. While a person's knowledge is in the increase, and yet his zuhd towards dunya is not improving. His zuhd towards dunya is not improving. Lam yazdat min Allahi illa bu'da. This knowledge, forget about helping him at all. This knowledge will serve only one purpose. Because his zuhd is not increasing while his knowledge is increasing, this knowledge will serve only one purpose. And that purpose is to put a distance between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
In other words, there is a huge relationship between ilm and zuhd. Without zuhd, there is no ilm. Because that ilm is what kind of new ilm? Ilmun fil lisan. If the knowledge enters into the heart, becomes ilm and nafi'ah, you'll see zuhd happening. So one indicator that you have zuhd in your heart, or the knowledge that you have is turning into beneficial knowledge, ilm and nafi'ah, you check your zuhd level. So what is this zuhd that's so important that Rasulullah uses it in this manner? Some people think we said a zahid person, a person with zuhd is a person who leaves dunya. Who doesn't care about dunya anymore. Dunya means nothing, therefore he just locks himself in a cave and lives like a hermit, a monk. He doesn't care about his family, he doesn't care about his duties and responsibilities to the society. He becomes a Sufi. Some people use the word Sufi. In the olden days, they used to wear these people Zuhad as part of, a, part of their training symbol. They used to wear a Suf, a clothing made out of rough wool. On the street, if they see somebody walking around completely, you know, walking around, they say, oh, Sufi, a person who left the dunya. A person who left the dunya is wearing the worst possible clothing, a rag on his head uh, or, or around his neck, it's something Suf. Therefore, he's a Sufi. It's a training process for them. He became a Zahid. Before the Sufi word, the word was Zahid, Zuhad. They used to use amongst the companions and the tabi'in and tabagut tabi'in. The word Sufi came right after. Yeah? In our understanding today, as I said, as, a, as an influence of the Orientalists, we think that automatic definition of a Zahid person, a person who doesn't care about dunya. That's not it. Look what Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says. I'm coming from backwards. What is Zuhd not? Then I'm going to explain what Zuhd is. قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم عن أبي ذر رضي الله تعالى عن إن ترمذي إمام ترمذي has this particular hadith الزهادة في الدنيا ليست بتحريم الحلال ولا إضاعة المال ولكن الزهادة في الدنيا ألا تكون بما في يديك أوثق بما Subhanallah. If we understood this, we can go home. If we didn't understand this, we have to spend some more time on this one. Zuhd is not, in dunya, is not making haram to yourself what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already made halal for you. Okay, let me read that again. الزهادة في الدنيا ليست بتحريم الحلال ولا إضاعة إضاعة المال or to wasting away giving away your wealth unnecessarily without any cause just wasting your wealth Allah subhanahu has given to you you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth in the land of honey and milk everything is provided for you you're rich MashaAllah, you have four Rolls Royces, no more Rolls Royces, Rolls Royces don't, okay, Ferraris in your car, in your car park, yeah, but no, 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 you go, want to go and live in a cave, you want to make everything that Allah subhanahu wa gave you naturally as halal, you want to make it haram, this is not zuhd. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says, wasting of your wealth is not zuhd. Or making something that Allah subhanahu wa already made halal for you, Turning that into haram for yourself is not zuhd. وَلَكِنَّ الزَّهَادَةَ فِي الدُّنْيَا However, the true zuhd in dunya أَلَّا تَكُونَ بِمَا فِي يَدَيْكَ أَوْثَقُ بِمَا فِي يَدِ اللَّهِ For you to put your full trust in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised you in terms of your rizq Rather than you trusting what you have in your own hands. 
I will explain this a bit later. You put your first trust, priority, in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised you in terms of your, your rizq, your sustenance, looking after you, trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then trusting what is in your bank accounts. What is in your, in the fridge, in your storage, putting this trust, that's zuhd. This has many connotations. If you understand this, you understand what greed is, what tama is, what hirs is, what tulul amal is. It has so many different layers. If you don't understand this sentence, you'll never understand Rida bil qadar. You will never understand tawakkul. You will never understand any of the basic foundational building blocks of a Muslim's character. You think that you know everything, you are in control of your qadar, you will say. If I don't work, who's going to feed me? You will say and literally believe in this. And when you lose your job, you go and seek therapy because your world is upside down, because you've lost a job. But if you believe in this, what Nabi Sallallahu says, that you have full trust in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in terms of your rizq, your sustenance, trust in Allah more than what you have in your bank accounts, that's called zuhd. Still confusing to some. So inshaAllah ta'ala, let's go and have a look at how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam defines zuhd. Basically zuhd is putting akhirah as your priority number one of your goal, as a goal in life. Putting akhirah, concerns of akhirah as number one concern in your life. Putting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala above everything else. Putting the consequences of your actions that is going to be judged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, therefore you act accordingly. Zuhd. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a long hadith, actually when I say long, it's not too long. He makes about six, seven points of definitions of zuhd in a very simple easy to understand manner then after that at the end he says this is zuhd so inshallah if you have your pens and papers or mental notes you write it down one by one because if you understand this particular hadith which I will not do anything else except to explain this hadith explain this hadith then we, we would have understood zuhd properly otherwise we would fall into the difficult and wrong, erroneous definition of the Orientalists. Zuhd means leaving dunya and neglecting everything else and try to be religious, spiritual and neglect your responsibilities. Leaving your home for two years and your mother is suffering, your mother is, uh, the father is suffering, your children are on the street and they, they, their tarbiyah is gone and your wife is suffering and you call the zuhd. That's not zuhd. So let's see what is the definition of zuhd according to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. An Abi Hurairah radiyallahu ta'ala an qal qal Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's how the hadith starts. Az zuhdu ذي زهد أن تحب ما يحب خالقك وأن تبغض ما يبغض خالقك الله أكبر First definition of Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم of what زهد is What does that mean? You prefer what your khaliq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Lord, Rabbil Alameen, loves above everything else. If Allah loves something, you love it. 
And you prefer this over every other loves because Allah loves it first. Similarly, if Allah hates something, Allah disapproves something, in your eyes, this is what is supposed to be disapproved of. Nothing else. Because Allah disapproves it. This principle in an adin called Al Hubbu Fillah Wal Bugdu Fillah. Aftalul A'malu Indallah, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, the best deed, best action in our deen is to love for Allah, hate for Allah. Now let's stop. And check our loves and hates. Pet loves and pet hates. Who do we love in our lives? Is it similar to or exactly identical to what Allah loves? And check our list of hatred, detestation, abhorrence. Check the things that we hate in our lives. From everything, A to Z. From mundane to profound. Anything. And check if this, if this list is also identical to what Allah hates. Then you have, hold on to Zuhd. You have Zuhd. So the first thing a Muslim has to develop in his heart, in his mind, in his mindset, is to love for Allah and hate for Allah. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala love? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves in the Quran. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Allah yuhibbu tawabin wa yuhibbu al-mutatahirin. So many? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yuhibbu al-muhsinin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like who? Mushrifin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't like mushrikeen, kafirin, munafiqeen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a list, all in the Quran. And Allah makes it very clear. Allah loves those people who are full of marhama, love in their hearts, compassion in their hearts, mercy in their hearts. So we check our hearts. Is our heart full of compassion or full of hatred for everything except ourselves? If there is no marhama, you need to change this. If you want to call yourself a zahid, if you want to possess this particular quality, you need to have it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like bakhil people, stingy, tight people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a particular quality called sakhawa, generosity. Are you a generous person or a bakhil person? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala checks this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves, loves the muslimin, muhsineen, the people who pursue excellence. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates mushrikeen, kafirin, the people who are enemies of Allah. So your love and hate has to be identical to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants, loves, and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates. Even this might be completely against your own self, your own self-interests. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates certain people around you that you hold so dear, certain behavior that the you people, you say you tolerate, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not tolerate, uh-uh, you don't have zuhd. الحب في الله والبغض في الله love for Allah, detest for Allah is one of the building blocks of a Muslim's character like al-amr bil-ma'roof wal-nahi an al-munkar you cannot extract this from the deen and have a deen without it yes in a different hadith Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam talks about certain actions that we must do Love for Allah, hate for Allah. Right at the end, he asks the question. He says, وَهَلِ الدِّينُ إِلَى الْحُبُّ فِي اللَّهِ وَالْبُغْضُ فِي اللَّهِ Isn't this the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nothing more than loving for Allah and detesting for Allah? In other words, he's asking a rhetorical question saying that the deen is love for Allah, hate for Allah. You're putting Allah as your priority number one. Ataullah al Iskandari, Qattasallahu Sirrahu al Aziz, one of our greatest mashaykh, he defines this hub love business for Allah in different categories. For those who, who have a little bit of understanding of this hub, uh, this is for them. If you find it a bit difficult, just switch off for a couple of seconds, and inshallah you might learn, but you might find it interesting for those who have some basic knowledge in this regard may benefit 
more, inshaAllah. He says there are four types of hub. The first one is Al Hubbu Lillah. Al Hubbu Lillah. Where you put the Rida of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your life above everything else. And never and ever you put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a secondary position. Every movement, every choice, everything that you decide, the first thing that you ask whether Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is happy with this or not. You do everything for Allah. Al-Hubbu Lillah. And one of the signs, the alama of this particular state, Ataullah, Ibn Ataullah al-Iskandari, Qattas Allah Surah Al-Aziz says, your heart with be, with, will be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's remembrance, the dhikr of Allah continuously. You're constantly remembering your Lord. Your heart is constantly making dhikr. Even when you're sitting with people, when you're not doing, your heart is occupied by Him because you concern, your concern is just your Lord, nothing else. Al Hubbu Lillah. The second type of Hubb is Al Hubbu Fillah, which is we just described. That is to love all those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. Al Hubbu Fillah. The alama of this. The sign of this love, this maqam that you have in your heart is although you don't know any of those persons that Allah loves and you never met them or you even never spent any time because Allah loves them, you also love them. Salihin, Siddiqeen, Shuhada, Anbiya, Sadiqeen, Ulama. You love them because you have such a love towards them because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Hubbu fillah. You like all the Salih people. You like religious, not people of religiosity, but the people of internalized religion, the muttaqeen. You love because Allah loves them. Yes? Although there is no benefit financial or otherwise comes to you, but you love them because Allah loves them. This is called Al-Hubbu Fillah, we just mentioned. There is another type of love. Al-Hubbu Billah. When the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely detaches himself from himself, all from his hawa, from his whims and wishes and caprices, so to speak, and utterly love those Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves without any judgment, without any opinion. Because Allah loves those, you just love them. And you believe that this is the alama, is that the nur Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts into your heart and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attracts your heart towards these people, whether you like it or not. You are at a different level, higher level. And the last level is Al Hubbu min Allah. Al Hubbu min Allah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala detaches you from everything else and He only keeps you for Himself. You, in the, all the makhluqat is nothing in your eyes except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a different level altogether. As Muslims, simple Muslims, we have to work on Al-Hubbu Fillah. The other ones, Lillah, Billah and Min Allah are too different and difficult for us. We need to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever Allah loves, we love, whatever Allah hates, Allah, the, we hate. This is the first level of zuhd. If you don't have this, don't talk about zuhd. Don't talk about zuhd. The second sentence in the hadith, second definition of zuhd, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, وَأَن تَتَحَرَّجَ مِنْ حَلَالِ الدُّنْيَا كَمَا تَتَحَرَّجُ مِنْ حَرَامِهَا فَإِنَّ حَلَالَهَا حِسَابٌ وَحَرَامُهَا عَذَابٌ يا لطيف تتحرج with ha not kha meaning to 
to protect yourself. If it was with kha, takharrajik ya kamat, khuruj. Protect yourself from what? Abstain. You you make sure that you don't get tainted. You don't get hurt. You protect your soul. You protect yourself from what? Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam says to protect yourself from the halal things of this dunya. Like the way you would run away and protect yourself from the harams of it. Well, hold on, it's confusing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to protect ourselves from the halals of the dunya like we protect ourselves from the harams of it. How does this work? Maybe different hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Actually, he qualifies it semi, qualifies it in the end of that sentence. He says, Halaluhu hisabun wa haramuha adabun. Everything that we possess, that we acquire in our lives, on the day of judgment, you shall be asked, how did you get it? How did you earn it? If it's wealth, money, where did you get it from? Was it a bribery? Was it stolen? Was it uh, as you confiscated somebody, somebody's job, I mean, somebody's work, somebody's wealth? Uh, did you, you know, you were the mafia boss? Did you bully somebody? Every single penny will be questioned. So halal, when you get halal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to question you whether you like it or not on the day of judgment. Halaluhu hisab. Hisab, everybody knows what hisab is. Halaluhu hisab. If you were determined at the end of your mahkamah on the day of judgment that your earnings were from haram source, haram places, haram, you received it from the haram means, then what will happen to you? Haramuhu azab. It's going to be paid in Jahannam. So a Muslim, a silly Muslim, would not run after more than what he has. So he will be, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guaranteed my rizq. I'll work, I'll fulfill my obligations, not a problem. But the guy is learning billions of dollars and billions more, billions more. And he's got no other concern. And he becomes more stingy, more bakhil, more greedy. He does not share anything. He doesn't see himself as a trustee. Of that wealth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to him. But he thinks that he owns it. He hoards it. Hoards it. And hoards it. And nothing else. He doesn't want to share it with anybody. And when the time comes, he cocks it. Then he dies and his children enjoy it. He didn't want to even give it to his children initially. But the sharia gives it to them. I was reading in one on uh, the age newspaper. That odd spot. One very famous... The rubbish picker in New York City, a Jew. He used to go from one rubbish, uh, the, uh, rubbish box to another rubbish box in the city, main street, and pick old burgers, half eaten burgers, half sandwiches, because there were, yeah, half drinks, and he's got a bag with him, he just walks around with a trolley. When he died, when he died, they said in his will, he has given $17 million to one of the Jewish hospitals in his will. He was a billionaire. And yet, because he's bakhit, he's stingy, he hoards, he could not even enjoy his food. He could not buy from anybody. Because he is, his heart, he's stingy. The people who are stingy, this is suffer from the, the disease of nafsul ammara, greed, hurs, tama, bukhul. They cannot share with anybody. So they want to, this is a sickness. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says, the only thing which will satisfy Bani Adam, if you give him, he says, one valley full of gold, he would want the next one. This is in our nature. The only thing which will satisfy is a handful of dust on his face when he dies. This is our nature. But zuhd is not this. <clears throat> zuhd is to avoid the halals. I mean, enjoy the halal to the best of your ability. Fulfill your obligations with it. Share it. Give it. Use it to your advantage. But not hoard it. And at the end of the day, the reality is that you shall be questioned of how did you get this wealth? How did you accumulate this wealth? It's hisab. Auditing. Taxation department, 
in this dunya chases you if you make a little more money. ATO, whoa, you're tagged already. A day, uh, if you're under the microscope, you had it. Some people get away with the tax evasion, cheat the system, but on the day of judgment, all the secrets will be opened. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can never hide anything from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot get away with any of them, every single penny. Sorry, we don't use the word penny anymore. Every single cent. How did you earn it? Where did you spend it? Did you pay your zakat? Did you fulfill your obligations towards the community? How about your da'wah? How, did you give? Or you just sat on it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in other words, you had the disease in your heart. And where did you spend it? Or with your friends, mashallah, you are so generous. Oh, you gave so many feasts to people, but your own family were begging for money to buy milk. You're so stingy towards your own family, but towards your friends because you're shut off in the community. Your prestige in the community is as a, as a rich and famous, generous man. Which, where was the balance? Nothing. You were so good in giving to people, but you could not even look after your own family. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask for everything. Everything. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, The feet of the person, servant of Allah, shall never be made to move an inch from the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until he answers for four things. <coughs> One of these four things is, where did he get his mal, wealth? How did he spend it? Where did he spend it? What did he spend on? I thought I got off, got, got off easy so with the ATO. Allah subhanahu's ATO is more stronger. You can never miss anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask you. So a smart person is a person. He says, okay, I have enough wealth, alhamdulillah. I have a house, I have a car, I have a business. That pays all my, my bills, uh, their bills and uh, pays for the education of my children, the ones under my care. Alhamdulillah. What is this, the rest, the greed? It's a disease. A Muslim must be rich. If you're born into a Muslim family, yes, rich. The idea is to not to put the love of that wealth into your heart. When you can separate this love of dunya, the, the wealth, from your heart, your heart only belongs to Allah, love of Allah, Muhabbatullah, dhikr of Allah, dunya stays as dunya. And no matter, even Islam encourages you, you to have dunya in your hands, not in your heart. Salih Muslim, who's rich Muslim, is the best Muslim. Because he can do so much for da'wah work. I said, Salih, rich Muslim. Salih, good Muslim. How good Muslim? He doesn't worship the money. When you put that money into your heart, that money is no longer in your pocket. It's in your heart. You don't need any banks. You put the money in here, then it becomes destructive. What Rasulullah is saying in this component is not to put that love of that money into your heart. Although it's halal for you, you have the ability to earn millions. Don't let that be in, into your heart. Let it be in your hands. Use it for your advantage. لا حسد إلا فثنتين Nabi says, there is no envy. There is no envy except for two persons. One is an alim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given so much knowledge. He uses his knowledge to judge people and teach people. He benefits from his knowledge. And the second one is a person whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given wealth. With this wealth, he gains his pleasure. Whose pleasure? Allah's pleasure. By doing the right things. He's just a money keeper, a mana keeper. On the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask you, where did you get this? How did you spend it? Everything will be there. So when we say Zahid, a person who detaches his heart from the worldly possessions. You might have it in your hand. You might have billion dollars in your account. May Allah give you more. As long as you use it to gain Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure. As long as you don't worship it. In English we call this worldliness. Don't have hubbu dunya. Don't have the mal of dunya in your heart. But have it in your hands. In the olden days, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, In your time, wealth is bala for you. But towards the end, wealth in the hands of a Salih Muslim is the best thing to have. Because he can use it for da'wah. 
He can use it to help the Muslims. We are the richest people on earth. But we are the stingiest people of heart. You go to the Hijaz area. You go to Saudi area. So people are so rich, their toilets are made out of pure gold. Toilet seats. MashaAllah, blessed toilets. Yeah? And you go 200 kilometers away to African Horn, the other side, children are dying. The same children who also says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Your brethren. Because this one is more poorer, the one with the golden toilet seat, than that person. He is bakhil in the heart. In other words, he's got no zuhd at all. His heart is absolutely attached to the wealth. Whatever that money is. But if your heart is detached, you have it in your hand, you can share it. Because when you begin to share it, you go back to the first definition of the hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Is when you put your trust in what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala's promise is, that He will give you, then your own trust in your own self. Allah is the one who gave you. A bakhil person, bukhul, bukhul, stinginess, tightness, miserliness is actually one of the diseases of nafsul ammara. In essence, it is an aqidah issue, this one. Because the bakhil person thinks, na'udhu billah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, sti- Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is stingy. If he were to give his money to somebody, Allah will not give him again. He's accusing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with stinginess. This is bukhul. A Muslim can never be bakhil. A Muslim is a generous person. He gives. The one who gave you when you were nothing. We came into this world as naked. Completely. Nothing was working in your body. Allah gave you parents. Allah gave you food. Allah gave you clothing. Look at you. MashaAllah. You opened up your cupboard today. You chose so many different clothings. You wear it and come back today. Who gave you those? Allah gave you. Oh, I got it. I worked for it. Or who gave you the strength to work? Who gave the intelligence to find a job? Who gave the intelligence to work out what to do? Everything belongs to him. And yet we don't trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Halal, you avoid. He says, you abstain. Avoid the excessive halal as if you avoid harams. Similar to the way you avoid harams. But people misunderstand this concept. He says, brother, halal is halal. Why should we avoid Leave this dunya as if you're not going to die tomorrow. Don't you know the hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and prepare for the akhirah as if you're going to die tomorrow. Uh, what do you say, brother? Prepare for the akhirah as if you're going to die tomorrow. Are you prepared for akhirah? No, inshallah, I'm going to make tawbahs after. You will never make tawbah because you're chasing the mighty dollar at the moment. Yeah, it will never work. But Islam brings the balance. You are the trustee. Halal source, yes. But don't get the halal, even halal, come into your heart and take over. Halaluhu hisabun wa haramuhu adabun. The third sentence of the hadith says, Wa an tarhama jami' al muslimina kama tarhamu. This is also zuhd. When you feel tarahum, marhama, rahma in your heart towards the Muslims around you, like the way you feel tarahum, marhama, mercy to your own soul. Allahu Akbar. The compassion. To have compassion, to be compassionate, to have mercy is one of the basic foundational blocks of a Muslim's character and Muslim community. How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe the Muslimin in the Quran? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. At the end of Surah Al Fatih, last page. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Muhammadur Rasulullah. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. Anybody does? No. Alhamdulillah. Walladhina ma'ahu ashidda'u ala al-kuffari ruhama'u baynahum. Allahu Akbar. They are so stern against the enemies of Allah, the people attack Islam, 
They're so stern. They're not coward. Yes? But stern. But when it, when it comes amongst themselves, the way they treat each other, their relationship with one another, their interaction with one another, based on what? بينهم, based on pure mercy and compassion. Wallahi Azim, we have lost this. Muslims do not have marhama, tarahum, love towards one another. This was the unique attribute of every companion. That's why Islam was spread everywhere in the world. Because they felt this tarahum towards every human being. They carry a soul. They want to share Islam. How do the Muslims of today treat each other? Bro, are you, are you, are you, what are you? Are you Habashi? Oh, no good. What are you? Oh, you are Salafi? Na'udhu Billah, Astaghfirullah Azim. What are you? Are you Sufi? Astaghfirullah Azim. Who are you? Everybody is in a pigeonhole somewhere. And who are you? I am Shaykh Shuyukh. I am better than all of you. <laughs> yeah. What happened to Marhama? What happened to the mercy? Compassion that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to have. He is called, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala call him? He uses this the two of his names. Raufun Rahim. Ya Latif. Raufun Rahim. Where is the Rahim Muslimin? We have lots of Abdul Rahims. We even call them Rahim, yeah. But where is the and we have we call our daughters Rahma, MashaAllah, Mercy Min Allah. Where is the Rahim? We don't. Between husband and wife, if there is no marhama, if there is no compassion of father from the, to, towards the children, mother towards the children, towards each other, that family is finished. Then upon, upon marhama, upon that compassion, comes love, muhabba, mawadda. Because if there is no compassion, you cannot love somebody. If there is no mawadda, there is no love, there is no trust. If there is no trust, there is no respect. If there is no respect, there is no loyalty. These are all building blocks on top of each other. You cannot have a roof and imagine that this is a house. You need to have foundations. The foundations of every Muslim is, starts with tarahum, with marhama in the heart. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says, to have marhama towards muslimin, like the way that you have marhama upon yourself. When you're cold, what do you do? Oh, get me a jacket because you want to protect yourself. When you're hungry, you feed yourself. When you have a problem, you solve, go and solve the problem. But when your fellow Muslim is suffering, when your fellow Muslim is hungry, when your fellow Muslim is in dire straits, what is your attitude? If you don't feel anything, then there is something wrong. You don't have this tarahum in you. Why does Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, he whose neighbor is hungry, gone to sleep uh, with a uh, hunger, hungry stomach, and he himself with full stomach goes to sleep, is not one of us. What does that mean? Towards your neighbors, you have to have this tarahum, this marhama. Wish for your brother what you wish for your self, this tarahum. And actually, according to Imam Ghazali, part of the duties of akhuwa towards one another, this is the least. The least standard, the worst possible standard, that you wish for your brother what you wish for yourself. A true Muslim is the one who puts his brother's needs over his own needs. Yes? Putting your brother's needs over your own needs. That's true brotherhood. He's hungry. Don't worry about it. I can stand. He's a, he's a bit weak. Hey, hey, brother, you eat my lunch. Brother, uh, I can, inshallah, the delay my payment for my house. But you, you want to lose your house. Here's the payment. Take my money, inshallah. You're putting the need of your brother over your own needs. This is Islam. This is Zuhd, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says. If you don't have this quality, you don't, you don't have that Zuhd. The fourth sentence, fourth definition of Zuhd, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, وَأَن تَتَحَرَّجْ عَنِ الْكَلَامِ فِي مَا لَا يَعْنِيكَ كَمَا تَتَحَرَّجُ مِنَ الْحَرَامِ Subhanallah. Now, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as if seeing our condition of today, he's just talking about us. 
our community. Like the way he says, you avoid, protect yourself from profanity, obscene, obscenity, backbiting, haram words, haram words, you know, haram talking, haram speech. The moment that you protect yourself from ma la ya'ni, vain talk, empty talk, trivial talk, small talk, whatever talk you call it, talk, social talk, which has no benefit whatsoever to you or to the other person. When you can avoid ma la ya'ni, like you avoid haram talk, this is zuhd, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says. Subhanallah, how are we going to do this? When two, two Aussie Muslims get together, after salam alaikum, yeah, okay, what do they talk? They don't know what to talk. They don't have any knowledge. Uh, how's the weather, bro? Yeah, okay, the weather's good, finished. How was the footy? Okay, footy's good. How much money are you making? All right, how's the business? How's this? How's this? Okay, then what? Nothing. And we talk nonsense. And most dangerously, we begin to talk about other people. Ghiba comes in. Namima comes in. Other people's problems. All just juicy bits. The gossiping. Haram starts. Astaghfirullah al-Azim. Sukut in Islam is one of the greatest ibadah. Sayyidul Akhlaq is sukut. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says. Excuse me, what do you mean? Being silent. As-salatu imadu din Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says. As-samtu afdal. Salat is imadu din but protecting your tongue and not talking, nonsense, which is zuhd, is better than that, he says. As-siyam <coughs> jannah Siyam is a shield against the fire of Jahannam, literally. But it says, as-samtu afdal. As-sadaqah, something else. But samt, silence, keeping your tongue, not talking, is afdal, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says. Subhanallah, how are we going to do this? Oh, my sisters, may Allah help you. But there is one exception. When we get together with Muhammad Hassan, we just talk about small talk. I can see the Raqib and Atid, the Malaika, Kiram and Katibin, they're shaking their heads. La hawla wa la qutla, astaghfirullah azim, astaghfirullah azim. Because they're all writing it down, recording it down. It's going to be used against us. Trivial, men to men talk. On, you know, small talk. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah? But if this talk was between husband and wife, you listening to your, please forgive me saying it, you listening to your wife's nonsense. Oh, today I watched the nappies. Okay. You just came from work, you had a hard day of 12 hours, and your wife starts to talk. MashaAllah. I burnt, I burnt the milk. I washed the, the, the dishes. I washed the, the, the... Okay. All small talk. And she feels it. Why? She feels... Okay. To listen to her nonsense, quote-unquote, is actually ibadah, according to Adin. You need to listen to your wife's nonsense. Because she, there is a need for her to talk. You look a quiet type. Don't talk back, because then you take her time. You just say yes, acknowledge, mm hmm that's how you feel, mashallah, oh, sorry to hear about that, just simple so short sentences. But let her talk. But you do not talk riba, namima, gossiping, backbiting, haram stuff with her. The, the other nonsense, we call this muhabba, between husband and wife. Yeah, really? Good. Talk about good things. And whatever you talk, trivial things with your wife, it's also hasana, reward for you. So brothers, you've got a new obligation. When you go home, minimum 40 minutes a day, you must listen to? <laughs> minimum. If it's a couple of hours, oh, beautiful sadaqah for you. So very nice. You listen to your wives, inshallah. Yes? I worked years ago, university years, as a TC, telephone counselor for Lifeline. I don't know whether they have Lifeline here or not. I'm sure they have. After training for a couple of months, now we're on the phone, listening to people. They say the biggest killer in this country is not smoking. It's not cancer. 
It's not this disease or that disease. The biggest killer in this country is loneliness. Yeah, especially amongst the elderly. 90% of all telephone calls that used to come through was from elderly women, not men. They were usually dead. But the women who live much longer, they need to talk. And their limit was half an hour. Every day the old lady will call without giving her name, just talk about everyday things. Because nobody comes to visit her. She's living alone. She needs to talk. She needs to talk. She needs to talk. And she will know uh, exactly how and she's got a time. I says, oh, we'll see you tomorrow, love. And she'll hang up and she'll call back the following day. There is a need to talk between husband and wife. Yes. She needs to be understood. She needs to be appreciated. She needs to express her feelings. Man doesn't have to express anything. Men are different. Different wired. So... When you speak, when you speak, وَأَن تَتَحَرَّجَ عَنِ الْكَلَامِ فِي مَا لَا يَعْنِكَ كَمَا تَتَحَرَّجُ مِنَ الْحَرَامِ You run away, you protect yourself from trivial talk the way you protect yourself from haram speech. That's Zuhd, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says. So don't talk. Hold your silence. Silence is literally golden in Islam. Don't talk. Uh, but, but it's uh, on social, a social behavior. Who cares? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, He's going to hold you responsible for every word that comes out of your mouth. Therefore, don't talk. But you can't do that to your wife. To your mother. Okay? To your daughters. To your sisters. You need to listen to them. Uh, the, uh, Sheikh uh, Ustaz Mahmoud says, uh, don't talk. So I'm not going to talk from now on. Hmm. No, 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 no. Talk. But don't talk with me. Nonsense. Yeah? To give up ma la ya'ni. Number five. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, wa an tataharraja min كَثْرَةُ الْأَكْلِ كَمَا تَتَحَرَّجُ مِنَ الْمَيْتَةِ الَّتِي قَدِشْ تَدَّنَتْ نُهَا Ya Latif Like the way you would abhor and run away and protect yourself from rotting meat or rotting food that is so disgusting you also run away, protect yourself from eating excessively why? Is eating haram, halal food haram? No, it's not haram. But it has some wonders, amazing effects on your heart. What do you normally have when you come home? You're starving. Yeah? And before you came home, you were fasting actually. You said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to read one juzah of Quran. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. You made all the intentions, right? When the wife did the best possible, your mother cooked your best dish. You ate and you ate and ate and after that when you said La ilaha illallah, she said Muhammadur Rasulullah and the, the sweets also came, your favorite sweets, all your favorite drinks and everything else, you're latif. And after that what happens to you once you really filled your stomach up? What happens? Uh, yeah, alright, what do I do next? <laughs> let me lie down a little bit, uh, let me relax a little bit, yeah? The laziness, the heaviness sets in. What happened to you reading Jews, Quran? Tonight is every Thursday night. Tomorrow is Friday, what do you call the uh, Friday? I thought you were going to do so at the calf. You're going to do this, you're going to at least mow the grass outside or something. Uh, inshallah later. What happens with this halal food? They're eating too much? It created that heaviness within you. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa is talking about this. Because uh, the lesser you eat, the amount that you require that you eat, you will be free from shahwatul batan. You will not worship food. You will eat enough to survive. You will not live to eat. Yes? That's Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying to us, eating too much food is not a good idea. Because you worry about just food, nothing else. And in this country, mashallah, when we open the fridge, 
we have difficulty in choosing the food. When we go to supermarket with chips, with chocolate. Uh -uh, I had done Cadbury yesterday, it's Tabaron today. Oh, that ice cream, no, 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 I don't like the Bula ice cream anymore, I want Sara Lee. In the middle of the night, 3 o'clock in the morning, your nafs says Sara Lee, French vanilla flavored. So it's not available in this shop, it's all shut. The only one available is in the city, in 7-Eleven, I have to go there to get it at 3 o'clock in the morning. This is too much. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will question you. Why did you go to 7-Eleven at 3 o'clock in the morning to get ice cream? But if your wife is pregnant and she says, I want ice cream, Sarah Lee, at 3 in the morning, that's a different story. <laughs> okay, that's a different story. You might benefit from on the side of it. Oh, your Habib tea, 3 in the morning, who would eat? It's cold, freezing outside. You want ice cream? No, it has to be one particular ice cream from that shop. So you have to go and get it. Yes, inshallah. But you need to avoid, avoid excessive eating like you would avoid rotting, rotting haram food. Number six, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, وَأَن تَتَحَرَّجَ مِنْ فُطَامِ الدُّنْيَا وَزِينَتِهَا كَمَا تَتَحَرَّجُ مِنَ النَّارِ This is the most difficult. Ya Latif, Ya Latif, Ya Allah, please help us Ya Rabbil Alameen, so difficult. He says, you must protect yourself from the zina, the decor, the illumins of this world, like you would try to protect yourself fall, from falling into haram, the temptations of this world. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in, uh, in uh, Surah Ali, Ali Imran, what does he say? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Zuyina lil nasi hubbu shahawati min al-nisai wal banina wal qanatir al muqantarati min al-dhahab wal fiddati wal khayl al musawwamati wal musawwamati wal an'am wal harf thalika mata'u al hayat al dunya wallahu indahu husn al ma'ab qul a unabbi'ukum Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next day says, Shall I inform you something that is even better than this? Then explains. But he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deliberately beautified, beautified in your eyes for mankind the love and the joys of that come from women or men for that matter. And children, offsprings. We love our children. We live for our children. We dedicate our entire life for our children. We do everything for our children. There is nothing that we won't do for our children. And stored up heaps of gold and silver, dollar, bank accounts, property, wealth, assets. And horses branded with their mark, our cars, prestigious cars. And cattle and land. That is the comfort of the life of this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Because we enjoy life with the means of these, we run after them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, with Him is more excellent abode. However, with whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds for you, is better for you. This is part of the nature of this dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it zina. Everything around us that is a utility, Something that helps us to enjoy a life that called zina, a decor of life. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this hadith he says, for you to avoid the zina of this dunya, like you would avoid falling into haram, is zuhd. Excuse me, what do you mean? I can't see the balance again. You mean we have to detach our hearts from everything and live like a kermit? Was it a hermit or kermit? Hermit? Kermit is a frog, right? Okay. Live like a hermit, like a monk somewhere, a mystic in somewhere, you know, no. The idea again is to not to put anything in everything that comes to your way into your heart. It is said about many of the mashaykh, especially Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. 
He was giving dars like this. Somebody walked in. He said, Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. He whispered in something in his ear. And he said, Alhamdulillah. <coughs> Subhanallah. He said, Alhamdulillah. And continued with his talk. After a few minutes, somebody came. The same person came in and whispered something in his ear again. He said, Alhamdulillah. People said, Ya Shaykh, what's wrong? Why do you say Alhamdulillah in two cases? He said, this brother came and said to me, in the shopping complex where my shops are, he was a merchant, it's on fire. And he said, your, your shop is in fire, you're losing all your stock. The warehouse is going. And he said, at that moment, I looked at it into my heart. Is there any attachment of any love of that property that I have, the shops that I have, in my heart? When I, when I looked at it into my heart, there is nothing, no love for. In other words, my heart is detached from that, that particular mal. I said, Alhamdulillah, doesn't make any difference to me. My heart is intact. After a few minutes when he came back, he said, sorry, misinformation. Every other shop is burnt except yours. I still looked into my heart. Was I feeling any happiness? Uh -uh. The same feeling that I had, the yaqeen that I had with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I said, Alhamdulillah, this is zuhd. Yes, this is zuhd. But if something happens to us, then what happens? Another shaykh, which I will not mention his name, he was giving dars again. The same thing happened. He came around, somebody came and says, your shop is on fire. And, but the whole place is on fire. He says, accept your shop. He said, Alhamdulillah. But with happiness. He says, for this, Alhamdulillah, I made tawbah for 30 years. I still feel guilty, he says. Why did I say Alhamdulillah? Because he said, okay, mine is safe. How come I did not have that tarahum, marhama, compassion, feeling for the rest of the Muslim, the Muslim community? They're also my brothers. Their property is being damaged and mine is not. And I said, Alhamdulillah, in that moment of ghafla, that moment of heedlessness for a split second, I realized what I've done. He says, I still make tawbah from it. Islam is very sensitive. Islam is a balance. But we have lost its beauty. Our next door neighbors are Muslim, we don't care. Or oh, he's Iraqi. Or oh, I'm a Lebanese. Or oh, I'm a Pakistani. Or oh, what's that one? Oh, I don't know, some from, somewhere from Africa. Dirty, dirty. Stop rosy. I heard. I was having an argument with somebody yesterday. Because of this ra racism of business. No. We're one. So we need to put everything into perspective. The perspective is, the perspective is, we came to this world with nothing. We shall only leave this world with nothing in terms of worldly possessions are concerned. Ad-dunya mal'oonatun wa mal'oonun ma fiha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this dunya is cursed. Everything in it is also cursed. Illa dhikra Allahi ta'ala wa ma walahu aliman aw muta'alliman. Everything in this world is cursed. In it, everything, because this world is just temporary. Why would you give the cursed thing in your heart? It's just a means for you. Okay, there is, there is not a single way out that you will leave this world. You need to live in it. Yes, you enjoy it. You benefit from it. But don't get the love of this dunya into your heart. This is zod. Many people, unfortunately, do the opposite. Then they, when they realize it, they want to give away. They can't give away because it became a character. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the seventh one, he says, وَأَن تَقْصُرَ أَمَلَكَ فِي الدُّنْيَا And the seventh definition of zuhd is when you shorten your desires in relation to this world. تَقْصِر قَصْر Shorten the salat. We say we're praying two rakats when you're traveling. Yeah, shorten. Shorten your desires towards your desires, your amal towards this dunya. What does that mean? In Islamic terminology, there is a term called tulul amal. Amal means desires. Tool means this desire is stretches to long years. Unfortunately, 
This is part of our challenge also. You ask a young man, he's sitting there, handsome, he's got a beautiful gel on his hair. He thinks that he's Mr. Universe. I am he's sure he is. Okay, tell him, are you prepared to die tomorrow? He said, what? <laughs> you lost your mind? He says, I could live at least, I'm 17 at the moment, another 45, 50, 60. Man, by the time I, I I've got long years to live. What, what are you talking about? I'm not going to die. I'm going to live until ripe old age. Like my great, great, great grandfather, 85, 90, like, inshallah. That's his belief. He convinced himself. Tell me, does he have any guarantee? No. How about the middle-aged man? 35, 40. He's got children, a couple of children, daughters and sons. Or oh, inshallah, uh, I will inshallah, as soon as my first daughter gets married and my grand, I have first grandchild from my first son, then after that inshallah, I'm going to slow down a little bit. And after that, I've got another 40 years to go of living, according to his thinking. He's not thinking of death. And I'm going to make tawbah and come back better, better Muslim. Mm -mm. You ask anybody, they have plans for the future. This is called desired future. It, the, the dreams, fantasies of life. This is called Tulul Amal. What this does to a person, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, what this does to a person is it stops you from one thing. It makes you forget death. When you forget about death, your heart becomes more attached to this world. Naturally. If you, somebody says to you, don't worry about it, everything's fine, taken care of. You convince yourself that you're going to live long. And what does this desire to live long and uh, putting under the carpet of the concept of death, what does it give you in return? What is the, out, the result of this particular behavior? You delay tawbah. When you sin, you say, Inshallah, when I get old, I'm going to make tawbah. When you forget about death, Hadimul Ladat, the break of joys, what do you do? You delay, postpone your tawbah. When you pray, the postpone your tawbah, what happens each time you sin to your heart? Stained, 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 then you don't feel anything anymore. You become Ahlul Dunya. And you run after the mighty dollar. You, everything the opposite of this particular hadith says, you do. You become selfish, self-centered. You just want to be captain of your own ship and you want to possess everything, your hoard. You become self-centered, self-conceited. You become arrogant. You declare yourself to be a taghut at the end. No matter what you possess, nothing will satisfy you. But... Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for this reason, for you to keep your death right before your eyes and constantly keep the rida of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before your eyes, that akhirah before your eyes and constantly be in a state of tawbah, ibadah, that conscious living of true Islam, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, وَأَن تَقْصُرَ أَمَلَكَ فِي الدُّنْيَا فَهَذَا هُوَ الزُّهْدِ He says, and this is nothing more than zuhd. Ya Latif. How in the world are we going to inculcate these concepts within us? Who talks about these topics? Well, in one particular talk, the particular gathering, I began to speak about death, and one of the elders says, Stop talking about death to young people. I said, Why? Oh, you're scaring them. I said, Ya Latif, they should be scared now so they can prepare for the hereafter. Uh, I, I think you are the one who's scared. You don't want me to talk about death. He says, Yeah, I don't want you to talk. I'm afraid of death. No use being afraid of death. Because whether you like it or not, Kullu nafsin, Zaiqatul maut, every soul will taste death. Whether you avoid it, whether you run away from it, whether, whatever you do, you can never and ever, everybody's going to die. But our job is to shorten our amal. Our job is to live with the principles laid down by Quran and Sunnah. <laughs> Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, our master, our teacher, the muallim, the greatest muallim, teaching us how to come close to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So, if we were to summarize in a couple of sentences before we close up, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to us, the true zuhd is when you love for Allah 
and when you detest hate for Allah. You check this condition first. When you begin to love everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves, when you hate everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates, then you're on the first step of Zod. You're a basic Zahid. Secondly, when you are earning your living halal, making sure that it is halal and you don't become greedy. Tama' and hirs doesn't set in your heart. You don't hanker after other people's property. You just receive, you earn in the halal. You work hard. It's far to work hard. You need to look after your family. You need to fulfill your responsibilities. Not just leaving them and that's not good. But don't overdo it that it possesses you. Takes over you that you do not have time for anything except just making money. Right? This is not it. Thirdly, when you, you treat every Muslim with compassion, with love, with rahmah, like you want to be treated yourself. Then, Avoid speaking trivial, nonsensical, ma la ya'ni words. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says so. Otherwise you'll be questioned for everything that comes out of your mouth. Isn't, he says, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa isn't your tongue that causes the greatest failure on the day of judgment that causes you to go to Jahannam? This little device here. You guarantee me two things, he says, I guarantee you Jannah. What is that one, the first one? Yeah? The one that we cannot control. It's, it's, uh, it's size is so small but what it achieves yellow thief and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also advises part of uh, zuhud is to avoid excessive eating for like we run away from haram uh, foods and last one Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says second last one don't be fooled by the zina the decor, the bells and whistles of this dunya, it's all part of the test of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, the last one he said, shorten your desires, don't spread them into long distances, which makes you forget death, which stops you making from tawbah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to become amongst the true zahideen, inshallah. We need the zuhd more than everything else, because this is true Islam. Not a particular label, a name for some people or some group of people. This is the true character of a Muslim. And you would see in Jannah, inshallah, everybody is a Zahid. They all were Zahideen, inshallah. Ta'ala. Because this is, when, this is a, the greatest indicator that you have received this ilm and nafi'ah, beneficial knowledge, and that it has changed your character and you have internalized the teachings of Islam, regardless of who you are, where you come from. You will be subjected to the same questioning on the Day of Judgment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be checking whether you have these qualities. And this is nothing more than zuhd. I tried to summarize it as, pos as, as short as possible. I am sure you will have lo lots more questions. And inshallah, for the next 10-15 minutes, we shall inshallah entertain those questions, if you have any. If not, you'll save me so much time, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakum Allah khair jazaa wa akhir da'wana. And Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Um, may Allah reward uh, the Shaykh for sharing us uh, his advice. Um, I'm sure I've personally I've benefited a lot from the talk and I pray that Allah will make it beneficial for all of us. Uh, it's something, I see some of you are taking notes, uh, but I'm sure it's something you need to revise over and over again and reflect on. And um, uh, are there any questions? So I've, I did put some papers on the stairs for the sisters. So if you can pass it down now. Uh, if you have any, any pieces of paper that you want to pass it to me now. Um, I've got a few here. But if, you, if any of you have any questions now, you want to stand up and ask. Are there anyone? No, I've got two questions here. Jazakum Allah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. Says, my mother can be lonely sometimes. 
But when I call her, she likes to gossip. How to avoid this? She really likes to talk. If I stop her, she gets angry. If I don't talk to her, she gets lonely. <laughs> if a person did not receive proper tarbiyah in terms of controlling tongue, not to make ghibah, not to make namima at a younger age, unfortunately this ghibah becomes a big problem as you grow older. And this is common and is true for all families almost in this day and age amongst the Muslims. People love to talk about other people. If you are in a position to educate your mum, which is impossible, on the haramness of namima and riba, what happens to those people who make namima and riba? What kind of punishment? She will accept, believe me. She will say yes, 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 but she will still do it. Usually people make riba or namima because they are either angry with somebody or somebody wronged them or perceived wrong and they talk, like to talk about the same thing, ready to repeat the same thing over and over again. Our neighbor got a Muslim builder to build his house. For some reason, in his idea, he did not finish the house. Certain things were missing from this corner, from that corner, from that corner. And he paid money, according to him, good money. Hard-earned cash. But each time I see, Salam Alaikum to my neighbor, he will open up his mouth, and for 45 minutes, the same story, and making riba about this Muslim builder. Ya Latif, what do I do? I go around with uh, earplugs? Doesn't work. If I don't say Salam Alaikum, I'm in trouble. He's my neighbor. He's got haq on me. If I say Salam Alaikum, I'm in trouble because I need to listen to his nonsense. Which I know to be not true. But no matter what I say, and he's much older than me, at least 25, 30 years older than me. He's an elderly person. It's impossible the logic, the reason with him. What do I do? Sounds similar to with your mom? Yes. I went and asked my teacher, what do I do? He said, you need to be a master juggler. You need to be a good diplomat. He says, you say, Salaam Alaikum, and you start the conversation before he starts the conversation. <laughs> On a topic that is completely irrelevant to his, his, uh, what he's about to talk. <laughs> and the moment that you sense it, that you're going to mention the name of the person, the builder, instead of mentioning his name, oh, mention something else, and steer the conversation to something else again. Then you are doing two things. You're doing him a favor. Firstly, he, he is not preoccupied with that particular concept all the time. And secondly, you don't give him a chance to do riba. And thirdly, you don't sin as a result. So with your mom, Assalamu alaikum mom, how are you today? Did you know what happened today? Says what? She says, uh, "This happened. This happened. My child. The, 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 this. The, no, not no, not in the bad sense. Oh, he he's got a, the, the the one of those recognition things, a, a medal at school. And uh, she, uh, before ten minutes, he's already into your world, not in her world. So you need to you need to arrest that particular discussion and change it to your advantage." Otherwise, you know that each word that you listen go uh, gossiping, you are sinning also. Because when Nabi Sallallahu it's a part of our adab, is when somebody gossips deliberately, their part of the adab is that you stop that person. And it's your mother, you cannot stop your mother, she'll tell you off. Yes? Secondly, you need to come to the defense of that person that uh, the riba has been made about. You say, what, the, 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 you come to defend that person. And thirdly, most importantly, you have to get up and leave that particular majlis in protest of what has been happening. How are you going to do that with your mom? She'll be more upset with you and she'll be making more ghibah about you to her friends. My daughter left my house. <laughs> so what do you have to do? You have to be smart, a diplomat. You need to use words, make sure that you don't give in to her 
conversation skills. Yes, she's a master at speech and she knows, but be, come up, write down this scenario. She says, I'm going to talk about this mum, one, second, two, three, four. Yeah, okay, now I'm going to take this conversation. If this happens, this happens. How do the sales people on the telephone sell you things? They already got a script in their hands. And if you refuse, so I don't want anything, it says, oh, they ask you another question. So that they keep you in the discussion again. Yeah, with your mum, you have to do, learn to be a master juggler. You need to be a diplomat. Otherwise, there is no way out of this. You can't say, I can't listen, I can't talk. Yes, you are in a predicament, but there's a practical step that you can apply, inshallah. <laughs> Allahu alam. And better still, before you talk to your mother, you make an intention in your heart. Ya Rabbi, only for your rida, I'm going to talk to your mother. Talk to my mother. Because my mother is everything to me. And I want to have a dua. I want to have a rida. Therefore, please, Ya Rabbi, help me. And my intention is to fulfill my obligation towards my mother. You make that intention. Ya Rabbi, please help me. Put your case to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then pick up the phone. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. rahim Yeah? But if in the first, second and third, it's all going back to the, what do you call, uh, riba, then eventually, because your intention is correct, you have niyyah in your heart with sincerity, ikhlas, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help you, inshallah ta'ala. But you need to be strong. If you, don't, if you don't give clues to your mom to make more ghibah of people, then you'll be okay, inshallah ta'ala. How do we make our hearts alive in our worship? If you know it, you please tell me. I can also keep my heart alive too. You're asking for a person whose heart is dead. Hearts, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam speaks that hearts become rusted. Like water, when it touches an iron, it becomes rusty. They said, Ya Rasulullah, what is the jila? What is the polishing of the heart? How do we polish the heart so it can stay alive? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in one particular hadith mentions two things. In a different hadith mentions something else. First one he says, Dhikrul maut or tafakkurul maut. Thinking of the death. As a daily routine, it's an ibadah in itself, for you to make rabata, connection with your death, your own death. Not talking about death, but your own death. You sit down in a, in a nice corner, when you're sitting on your chair, close your eyes and imagine, right at that moment you're dead. You're about to die. Malakul Maut is just before you. And he wants his... You are, and just imagine you're dying on the seat. What will happen then? You go through the steps. You go through the, uh, the what do you call, the exci not excitement, the sadness in the house. Your wife, your husband, your spouse discovers that you're dead. No longer. And your children discover. And right at this moment you're dead. What do they do? They call the sheikh. They don't need the sheikh quite easily, but at that time they do sheikh the most precious thing. Oh, sheikh, come. My, okay, the sheikh comes, he's dead. Inna lillahi wa Then after that, what did I do? They called the caretaker, the mosque, janazah. And can you imagine that? You, you put straight, and your, the, the, your jacket and your clothing is taken away. They put clothing on you, and people are so sad, everybody's crying. They take you to the morgue. They, the doctor declares you be, what do you call, physically dead. And after they, they wash you, ghusl, and then the, the, the kafan. Then after that, they bring you to the mosque, and everybody's praying janazah over you. Then you take it to yourself, to the, the qabr, the grave, and whoa, that deep, uh, the pit. And they're going to put you in there, and everybody's crying, everybody go home, and the soil is on your head, and they're completely covered. And Munkar and Nakar comes in that dark place. The questions are being asked Man Rabbuka wa ma dinuka wa ma nabiyuka. All those things that we learned when we were kids that we never believed in, it happens, it's happening right now. Then after that, oh, depending on whether you're a good Muslim or a bad Muslim, one of the khufar uh, minal, uh, what do you call uh, uh, one of the pits of Jahannam, or one of the gardens of Jannah, depending on who you are, and thousands years of thousands of years of either suffering or Jannah, and after that you're resurrected on the day of judgment. You go through these, these mental pictures in your mind, as if they're alive, as, as if you're watching a video. Then after that you wake up completely naked in that, that mahshar where sun is so close to and you see so many people, billions of everybody there. There's no more death, suffering and eventually your turn comes. You stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All these things that we learn, learn. The questions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks of your, of your salat, of your, how you earned your living, where do you spend your life. Uh, everything is questioned. Your books is given from right or left. You know all the story. Then 
Then you see the Sirat, the people going over, some people falling into Jahannam and burning for thousands and millions of years, and some people go to Jannah directly. You see all this. Mahkama with the other human beings, Mahkama with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then at that moment you say to yourself, Oh my nafs, you're not dead yet. You're still alive. Wake up. But wallahi, you're going to die. This is going to happen to you. Because Muhammad al-Amin, Sadiq al-Wa'ad al-Amin never lied. Quran never lies. If you're Muslim, this is going to happen to you. So be careful with your behavior with other people. Avoid hukuk al-ibad. Do not cheat anybody. Do not hurt anybody. With your words or with your hands. Do your salat properly. Because this is your life. Allah commanded you to do. So you give nasiha, bitter nasiha, bitter advice to your nafs. You talk to your own soul. This is ibadah. This wakes the nafs up. This wakes your heart up. So when you're in salat, subhanallah, it's a different feeling. But if you do this on a regular basis, you become a different person altogether. Second, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Tilawatul Quran. When you recite Quran, when you recite Quran, Quran also polishes your heart. That, that ma'nawi, that spiritual benefit that comes from Quran, even if you did not understand, it's amazing what it does to you. In Ramadan, inshallah, around the corner. Allahumma barik lana fi rajaba wa sha'ban wa balighna Ramadan. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to make dua. In Ramadan, when you read Quran constantly, what happens to you? You become a different person. That Quran has that barakah. In a different hadith, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Dhikr rahman Constantly making dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also keeps your heart alive. What does it mean dhikr, bro? Dhikr means dhikr. Remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Keeping Allah alive in your heart. His thought of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your heart. There are many different ways of doing it. You can make dhikr, la ilaha illallah. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. Think, subhanallah, wa bihamdi. Allah, you make astaghfirullah constantly in your heart. The heart receives this nourishment and the heart becomes alive again. So I, I, I tell you, I challenge you for one month. You know the uh, old brand, what's his name, Kellogg's? They say two weeks challenge. Take a month challenge. Making dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, say 1,000 times la ilaha illallah every day. Just telling you. And 1,000 times astaghfirullah every day. And 1,000 times salawat al-sharifah, any of them, a day, and see what happens. One month. What kind of sensitive person you become in terms of spiritual, uh, spirituality? Your heart becomes alive because it's like a steroid. It's like a medicine. Your heart begins to mend. If you don't give food to your body, your, food, your body the, the becomes weak, sick. So if you don't give dhikr into your heart, your heart also dies. So this is important. Dhikr, tilawat al-Qur'an, da'wah work, being in the khidmah of the others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins to keep your heart alive. That you are connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In your salat, then you are in a different world altogether. Different world altogether. Of course, knowledge. Knowledge. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Alaykum bi mujalasat al-ulama wa istima'i kalam al-hukama. I urge you to sit in the company of the ulama and listen to the wise words of the wise ones. Earnestly. Why? For verily, he says, for verily, hearts become alive with the nur of this hikmah of these wise people. Like the dead barren land comes alive when it sees rain. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, knowledge becomes, we call it enlightenment, we call, it, we call this refinement. When we begin to understand the truth and reality. If we never spoke about Zuh before here, he just came to the mosque and just went back home again and never heard of Zuhd. Some of you say, Subhanallah, Zuhd is this important? You just realize something. This is ilm, inshallah, turns into beneficial knowledge when you internalize it. So, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, when you do something wrong, haram, there is a dot, black dot put into your heart. If you make tawbah, wash it away. Alhamdulillah, it's gone. If you don't, one dot after another dot, one dot after another dot, the whole becomes the heart inside of the heart, inside wall, spiritual heart, becomes completely dark. No more nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is coming from outside. You don't feel anything anymore. So tawbah is also very important. Quran is another one. Dhikr is another one. Being, thinking of death is another one. Keeping the company of the salihin, sadiqeen. 
وَكُونُوا مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, being in the right company of the people who remind you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also another one. Because hearts, behavior is contagious. What is in his heart as a generous person will come unto me. الْعِلْمُ بِالتَّعَلُّمُ الْحِلْمُ بِالتَّحَلُّمُ Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says. This is all part and parcel of the same thing. There is not one single uh, the medicine that you take and it fixes you up. It is your change of perception of our deen. It is, Islam is not just rituals. Islam is a complete internalized values that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to as hidayah into our hearts that guides us in our lives. <coughs> Inshallah. That was a roundabout, longish answer to that question. Two moments. Communication between the members of the family. It's a long question, but I think uh, I said, remember, I said communication between uh, husband and wife is ibadah. Yes, but talking to other people, trivial things. I said trivial things, nonsensical. Mala ya'ni is a very special concept in our our deen, which does not bring any benefit to a person. This person or that person? To me or the other person? This is called mala ya'ni. Empty. Empty talk. But if the talk that you're going to have with your friend, with your brother, with your spouse, no, sorry, with your siblings, with your cousins, with your aunt, is beneficial, beneficial talk, beneficial information that is going to help that person. They're suffering from uh, something and you talk about them. This is an ibadah, you're helping a Muslim. This is part of the tarahum, having compassion towards that person. Communication must be done. People are islands these days. They don't talk to each other. But communication, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what does he used to do? When Muslims come, he just sit down and not talk? No. He used to smile, ask about the person. How are you? How's it going? And after Salat, he used to turn around after Fajr. Is there anybody who saw a dream in their life, their, 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 last night? Is there anybody who's got a sick person? Is there anybody who has a janazah today? So I can attend to. If there is a sick person, I can go and visit. If there is a person with a dream, I can interpret for them. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is showing concern for his flock. Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'iyyati Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says. All of you are responsible. If a father does not listen to his daughter or son, or mother doesn't listen to their what you call brothers and sisters, when they have genuine problem, but not ghiba problem, not namima problem, not a problem of not having a problem. That's a different, that's trivia. But we're talking about the person is sick. The person needs your help. The person is going through some difficulty with their VCE, with their no, not HSC, with their maths, with their English, with just sitting down and having a conversation is the best thing you can do. One of the signs of a good Muslim is when his Iman is developed, he becomes a person of tarahum, compassion. He feels for others. The moment that this tarahum disappears, this compassion, love, mercy towards others disappear, human being becomes selfish. The weaker the Iman, the greater the selfishness. In a family situation, if there is no communication happening between members, because they are all suffering from the same disease. A Muslim who is always compassionate, who puts the needs of others before his own needs. If you see your sister in tears, you say, oh, her boy problems again, or school problems again, she'll get over it and go to sleep, you're not a good Muslim. Uh, this is your own, uh, your own sibling. Same thing with a fellow Muslim. When you have that marhama rooted in your heart properly, you will always go and try to help. But remember, what Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warns in that hadith of Zuhd is ma la ya'ni, nonsensical talk, which has no benefit to her or benefit to you. Or haram talk, which has danger to you 
endanger towards the other person. Helping the person, helping the person is a duty upon a Muslim to another Muslim. This is part of the requirement of tarahum. We have duties towards one another. Yes, if there is no communication happening in your household, because people are not, they don't have enough knowledge, and they, their imams are very weak. You need to be in the company of people who spend associated people who've got good relationship with their members in their family. Good salihin Muslims. And you will learn this behavior from them. You will learn this behavior from them, inshallah. Ta'ala. There are many things can be said about this issue, but uh, it will go outside our topic. There is another question here. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. How to teach our youngsters, youth, to strive for excellence academically so can get good jobs, etc. while practicing zuhud? Is it wrong to study hard to aim for universities and good job opportunities, etc.? Is it against zuhud? Jazakumullah khayl jaza. From the handwriting, I can say that this particular sister is uh, Malaysian. Yes? I'm just joking, could be anything. <laughs> Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. In Islam, there are certain types of knowledge which is compulsory to acquire for both men and women. This is called fardu ayn knowledge. Talabul ilm, al ilm, fariratun ala kulli muslimin wa muslimatin. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says so. In Sahih Muslim, you would find this. It is fard upon every Muslim and Muslimah to acquire the knowledge. Ulama defined the knowledge, al-ilm, as ilm tawheed Islamic knowledge, fard knowledge. What is fard? That you have to learn to practice your deen. What are the things that you have to learn to avoid tarq of the harams? And what are the, the other commandments for you to purify your heart and tazkiyat al nafs that you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, accepts? This is compulsory for every man and woman. There are other worldly sciences. It is regarded as fardu kifaya. If a group of Muslims were to do it, the responsibility of that particular fard is lifted from the shoulders of the rest of the community. Yes? Acquiring any beneficial field in terms of study, in terms of trade, that is going to bring direct benefit to the Muslim community, according to our sharia, is fardu kifaya. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us certain abilities uh, that requires physical prowess, sometimes mental prowess. If it's physical prowess, you don't say, oh, I want to do that job. You're weakling, you can't handle that job. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given that responsibility to perhaps the males to do this job. Or for a female, you can do this particular job too. Not discrimination, just the optimization. That of benefit to the Muslim community. Yeah? But for you, as a Muslim, you must have this mindset. Remember, this is also related to zuhd. Zuhd is not completely divorcing this world and saying that this dunya, I don't want this dunya, dunya is rubbish. Yeah, dunya is rubbish, we know. But you need to live in this dunya. As if you're not going to die, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says. But you need to prepare for the hereafter as if you're going to die tomorrow. To keep this balance as zuhd. Yes, you need to. As Muslims, you need to study. You need to go to universities. You need to become the best possible managers. You need to become the best possible teachers. The best possible academics. Best possible tradesperson. Best possible whatever that field requires. To do this best possible is called ihsan. Pursuing of excellence. It is an ibadah, worship in our religion. But it doesn't mean that your job, your profession, your status becomes such an idol in your heart. That objective becomes such a big idol in your heart that enters into your heart. Instead of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you worship that particular job. This is haram. Yes, we want everybody to become doctors. Good to be a doctor. If your intention to become a doctor is to cure people, to help the ibadullah, to help the others for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so that you study Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's art on the person, and you bring that benefit to a person, Yes, it is fardu kifaya. You will benefit from this. But if, if your intention is, I'm going to make money. 
and I'm going to become the richest. I'm going to do this to the people. I'm going to make more money. You lost the plot. This is against the Zuhd principles. But if you have the intelligence, if your daughter, if your son has the intelligence, the IQ level to become a doctor, push them. It's working hard. Because nothing is haram in Islam except the ones that Allah and His Rasul told us to be haram. To study chemistry, to study biology as part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's laws. That it is actually an act of ibadah you're studying. Brother, I want to read Quran. Yes, you read Quran. But you need to pass your exam to get, uh, get into a good mark. Oh, I just want a media, uh, no mediocre. You need to pursue excellence. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in every Jum'ah that we hear from the, uh, the Shaykh in the khutbah? Inna Allah ya'mur bil adli wal ihsan. What does ihsan mean? Has many meanings. Pursue excellence. How do you pursue excellence? You become the best, not mediocre. Best in everything that you do. Best abid. Best zahid. Best person who helps others. The best student. Best mother. Best father. Best wife. Best in everything. Pursue ex- then that's an ibadah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. Inna Allah yuhibbul muhsineen. Allah loves those who have this ihsan within them. One of the meanings. So there is not, there is, it is, there is not a clash between the concept of zuhd and studying and getting best jobs. Becoming rich. It becomes a clashing problem when the love of those enters into your heart, possess, takes possession of your heart, when you stop worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why one of our mashayikh tells us, <laughs> although in your eyes you might see as a ni'mah, a blessing, if that blessing stops you from worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is not actually a ni'mah, although you see it as ni'mah, it is actually a niqmah, it is actually a curse, it is a bala unto you. Brother, we're making alhamdulillah lots of money uh, with our jama'ah. Uh, brothers, do you pray? No. You don't do salat? Because too busy making money at Jum'ah time. Uh, be making lots of money at Jum'ah time. Because this da'wah, bro. You sacrifice your salat and you stop praying Jum'ah? Oh, this is ni'mah, yes, coming through you, money. But this is bala. It stops you from worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the job gets into the heads of the people, the students, your, when you're teaching your son and daughter, the youth, youngsters, study only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Become such and such. I, I'm not saying this now to be let to boast. In 1980, I was doing my v, uh, HSC. There was not a single computer programmer that I know alive amongst the Muslims. And we used to use old card system, the old mainframes, still new. There was no new technology. I spoke to my chef, computer science, computer science, computer science. Yeah. I said to the, my teacher, I want to do computer science. He says, why? He didn't even know what computer was. He says, because nobody amongst the Muslims do this. I want to be the first one to do computer science. He said, why? He knows the answer. Because it is for the kifaya. Muslims must have this particular field also amongst themselves. If there is no butcher amongst the Muslim community, yes? And Muslims are forced to buy from the supermarket. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold everybody responsible. There must be some person who is the Muslim butcher. If there is no female doctor, that you force your wives to go and check for gynecology. Male doctors, the whole Muslim community will be held responsible. But if there was one Muslim gynecologist, female said, a doctor, Alhamdulillah, we forced one of our daughters to go and become a doctor, then the responsibility is over. This should be your attitude. Yes, my son, you do this. My daughter, you do this. I will do everything in my hand for you to study and successful. But you need to put your head down. But time of salat comes, salat. Time to go to the masjid, go to the masjid. Time to help in da'wah, help. Teach, teach. Madrasa, madrasa. Yep, you need to keep a balance. If you keep constantly to dunya, your dunya takes over by nature. Yes, and you just stay in the mosque and you don't take any responsibility. That's no good also. Even if you say 50,000 times La ilaha illallah to keep your heart alive, if your family members are drinking alcohol and they're going away to the the haram places because of your negligence, wallahi, you will go to Jahannam. But you never go to anywhere else except masjid. No, 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 no. You failed in your responsibility. You need to fulfill your responsibility towards your family members. 
under your care. It's fard upon you. So, when you provide an education towards your children, your objective should not be to get a best job. Your objective is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, provide benefit to the Muslim community, and best job on the afterwards. Best job afterwards. It's unfortunately, Muslims have a twisted understanding this in the century. Before when Islam was Islam, when Muslims were strong, we would handpick, the community used to handpick people like Dr. Dean, the people with superior intellect. They will handpick them and push them towards where? Medicine and law? No. They will be pushed towards ilm, seeking Islamic knowledge. They'll become the ulama, scholars. The caliber of the ulama that we have at that time were super, super intelligent people. Because these are the warathatul anbiya. These are the people who represent Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and teach deen. Look at the so-called ulama today. I'm using the word cautiously. If the child cannot get into university because he hasn't got the mark to get into even arts course. And what does the parents do? Oh, inshallah, you go to madrasa, I send you to South Africa, you become an alim. Alim Fadl course, and the guy comes, doesn't know dunya, doesn't know akhira. He is, he is not an intelligent person, and he's supposed to lead the community. How in the world is this going to happen? But all the intelligent children of today, what do the parents dream of? For themselves. They want their children to become doctors and brother lawyers and somebody who's prestigious in the community, so they can say to their families, look, that's my son over there with the cap, or oh, doctor. The other one is something else. If that person doesn't pray, doesn't know Allah, completely lost the deen, even if they become the Prime Minister of Australia, what benefit will that have you, for you in the hereafter? Nothing. So we need to keep a balance. Yes, we want our children to become successful in dunya we pursuits, in their, in their education, in their universities, in their lives, in their businesses. But first and foremost, the job of a father and mother, parent, is to put the love of Allah and his Rasul, Kitabullah, love of deen, into heart. Put that everything in the perspective. Dunya is dunya, akhirah is akhirah. Allah is Allah, and the rest is rest. When the child has this, he can be anything he wants. But first, that particular feeling, that personality, that identity must be in the heart of a child. If not, this question is beautiful. Yes, we must get them good jobs and cushy jobs and comfortable lives. Life is life. Then what? If the person dies as a kafir, although they were the richest and most comfortable, they had 40 uh, maids to look after their needs, they lost their akhirah. What are you going to do? يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءِ مِنْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, on that day, everybody will run away from their brothers. From their mothers and sisters, from their friends. Why is that? Everybody is pursuing each other. Because they failed in their obligations towards one another. So we need to look at everything in perspective. There is no such separation. There is no such thing as demarcation between social life and Islamic life. Political life and Islamic life. Religious life. Or the mosque life and the wedding life. Muslim is a Muslim in every space, every time, every place. Everything has to be rida and lillah, liwaj hillah. Everything has to ilahi anta maqsudi wa ridaka matlubi. Everything has that's called zuhd. I know many Zahid people, mashaAllah. I met one of them recently in Dubai. The man is one of the richest Muslims that I know, and he gives a lot, mashaAllah. There is a little app here, just a joke called uh, stress check. I put my stress level, goes to 88, extreme. I'm always stressed out. For him, I put on, it doesn't go more than three. The guy has millions in his hands, but nothing in his heart. Heart belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's constantly in salawat, constantly astaghfirullah, constantly making dhikr of Allah, constantly talks about the deen. But he's filthy rich. This is the Muslim. You ask for anything, he's there. He's there. One ideal Muslim I give you, maybe you will never understand this. One of my heroes is Abdullah ibn Mubarak. I agree with you. I agree with you. <laughs> Abdullah ibn Mubarak. 
great muhaddith, great faqih, great jurist, great alim, great scholar, third generation. He was, he was known in his time as the greatest warrior. He used to go to war in jihad for six months in the borders. He used to wear a niqab to cover his face because he doesn't want people to see it. Right at the front he's fighting. He used to spend six months in teaching. He used to spend other six months taking, going to Hajj. Hajj. In one of these journeys at Hajj time, the people around him, some of his students and the neighbors, they said, Yeah, yeah, Shaykh, we want to come to Hajj with you. Is it possible, please? And he's very rich. Listen. He said, Yeah, no problem, inshallah, let's go to Hajj together as a group. He says, One condition though. Remember, you have to prepare your own money, you have to go to Hajj with your own money, you have got your savings. The people who come to Hajj, they can't go into the tourist, you have to have fulfilled certain man istata'atum ilayhi sabila. You need to have the financial means. So, it says one condition, you have to bring all your money and give it to my treasurer so that we spend from one place, one from one market and one markaz, so for the barakah, inshallah. They said, okay, no problem, we trust you because everybody trusts him. They're true Muslims. So, every Everybody brought 350 people or so. They gave their money to the treasurer. And whenever they need any money from their own money, they go and ask my name is such and such. He gives the amount and writes it, records it down. They start going to Hajj. It takes them three months to go, not like 16 hours. Three months, the whole caravan on the back of the camels and horses and walking. Three months, every six, seven hours you sit and you eat and get up and all the expenses, whenever you need anything, he, they go and get it from the treasurer. They did Hajj, including buying gifts for their loved ones. That was a tradition. And all the way back again, another three months, they came back. Just before the last stop, they arrived at their destination, the last stop, he said, one more thing, please go to the treasurer and get whatever leftover money that you have from your account. They went. Everybody's original money in a sealed container, sealed bag with the names on it, the full amount was given back to each person. Who paid for the whole Hajj? Abdullah ibn Mubarak. Look at the wealth. Show me one Muslim who could do this. Show me. We all worship money. One way or another, degrees are different. We all want to be known. Oh, if we achieve something, we are specialists in area. We want, if somebody doesn't call us doctor, we get upset. If somebody doesn't call us sheikh, he says, well, well, <coughs> well I'm sheikh al-shayuk, call me sheikh. <laughs> if you went to hajj and somebody, uh, somebody doesn't call you hajj, you become upset. You have to call hajja. Hagga, depending on who you are. Yeah, you hug. If not, you get upset. We don't do things for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're supposed to do everything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chosen us for our profession, for our livelihood, is something different. But there is no different. Everything is interconnected. Everything is interrelated. Everything is together. But we are servants of Allah. Under all circumstances, whether rich, you're poor. You are intelligent, we are simpleton. Your duty and responsibility towards Allah subhanahu wa doesn't change. The Zuhd principles apply to you everywhere. There is no demarcation, there is no divorcing of dunya from akhirah. They are all together. We need dunya to get akhirah. Dunya is a horse, a, a, a mount that we used, used to get to akhirah. Without it you cannot. You cannot divorce dunya from akhirah. It has to be balanced. What Islam advocates is this balance. We call it Zuhd. By nature, human beings are always given to. That is easy. Nafs al-ammara. Hubbu dunya It's easy. Sins are easy. Things that we do is easy. Hard work is something that we try to shun. Don't come close to. Doing things to go to Jannah is difficult. Curbing our, our appetites is difficult. Our temptations are difficult. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshaAllah, 
make us of the true Zahidin inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of the Salihin inshallah. Sadiqin inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to have beneficial knowledge. Open our basira. Open our eyes that we realize who we are as servants of Allah. Conscientious Muslims. Where we carry the rida of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before anything else. We carry the love of Islam, love of Muslimin before everything else. We carry this deen as our flagship, as us in everywhere we go and live a life of Muslim in our entire lives. When the time of our demise comes, when we want to move on to the next world, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make those last moments as the best moments of our lives where Allah's rida is upon us. And we leave this world with the kalima La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to answer the questions of Munkar and Nakir easily. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be resurrected under the liwa'ul hamd of his Nabi, beloved Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to taste that from his kawthar, from the hawd of kawthar of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from his hand inshaAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us a hisab easy on the day of judgment. Let us go through surat easy inshaAllah on the day of judgment. Let us find ourselves behind Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, behind ashab ikram, and enter into Jannah with Dukhul al-Awaleen, inshaAllah ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us and our loved ones, all of them, the ones who lost at the moment, bring them back to Islam. And inshaAllah they should be amongst ourselves on the Day of Judgment as neighbors to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannatul Firdaus al-A'la. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also allow us to experience that Jamalullah from Jannah, inshaAllah ta'ala. This is the dream, ultimate dream of every Muslim.